Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today is the day, Holy Trinity Sunday, or as you may know or remember it by the day we say the really long creed. But today's the day where we talk about, as I shared with the children, one of those things that we believe that if somebody asks us to explain, we can't, which is really tough for us because we've all grown up in the era of human history where the thing that is prized the most is rationality, intellectual argumentation, scientific proof. And so people doubt the truth of something that doesn't fall into those categories, which God, by his very nature, is going to not fall into. It can't contain him, for he's made all of those things. And so as people of faith, we regularly encounter things that we believe not just by God's gift of our reason and our senses, but because He reveals that truth to us, even if we don't understand it. Even if somebody says, how does that work, and we can't explain it. And I bet you if you try that out, the answer I gave the kids, I don't know. You'll be surprised at some of the reactions you'll get. After all, you've probably all been asked one of those questions Questions that people who aren't believers like to ask believers, mostly because they know the answer isn't there, and they want to see you try and make one up. That way they can poke holes in it. Well, what is that person going to do if you just say, I don't know. I know it's true because God told me, but he didn't explain how it worked. And even if he did, there's no guarantee that I could understand it. He's God after all. What are they going to do? They might scoff and say, that's a cop-out, but they can't poke holes in it because you're admitting your reliance on God. And today, the Holy Trinity is one of those elements of our faith, that we believe that God is one God, yet three distinct persons. I can't explain that, nor can you, and God hasn't seen fit to reveal that truth to us, and so what do we do but trust in the truth that he reveals about himself. And the rest we leave up to him. Sure, we've come up with some clever ways to try and illustrate something about that relationship to understand it. I shared some of those uh, with the children. There's also the element of water can be manifested in ice or liquid or steam. But again, that falls short because that's just the same element. They're not distinct persons. Nothing really explains it. Even the creed we we say today, with all of its big words, is not an explanation, but rather a description of the truth that we believe because God has revealed it to us. All explanations fall short. And that would seem to be a huge problem in a world obsessed with proof and needing to know why and being able to understand how things work. But it isn't. Because the answer is simple. God's ways are beyond our ability to understand. All of it would be beyond our ability to understand if he didn't reveal it to us. I was a seminary student and I was teaching a uh, Bible class to college or high school students. And we did uh, Truth University's um, Does God Exist? I think they've probably done that here at some point. Um, And one of the points he makes is that through observation of the natural world, we can come to a reasonable conclusion that God exists. But that's it. We can't know anything about that God, his behavior, his demeanor, how he feels about us, the nature of his relationship to us. The only way we can know any of those things is through him telling us himself. And that's what he does in his word. He reveals himself to us. And today we celebrate that he reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These moments are where faith comes in. We believe in a spiritual reality that's just as real as the things we can see in the material world, but it doesn't operate by the same rules. 
And we're able to believe in that because God has given us faith through the gift of His Holy Spirit, given through His Word and sustained through that Word and the sacraments. So our two readings today that we're going to focus on is our Old Testament reading and our Gospel reading. And at first, they seem strange to have on Holy Trinity Sunday. We're not really talking about creation. And we're, what does the Holy Trinity really have to do with a great commission? Well, let's first look at creation. In our Old Testament reading, we're reading the first chapter of the Bible, the creation of the world and everything in it. And in that, the Holy Trinity... All three persons are present and working from the very beginning. God the Father, creator, and the instigator of the mission, creating the heavens and the earth. God the Son, who is described as the Word made flesh in John chapter 1, is the very Word of God in the beginning through which all things are made. You can remember that tongue twister in John chapter 1. In the beginning was God... And the Word was God and with God and, not, and through Him all things were made that were made, all that fun stuff. And then God the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, the word for spirit and breath are the same, ruach. And that is the spirit, the breath of life breathed into all living things, animating the life that God has created and given. And notice, you didn't get any say which is easy to understand at the first creation because you didn't even exist yet. But God in his mercy and love made us and brought us to life. The life, the breath of life, the spirit given to Adam and Eve and to us is a gift from God totally given of his own volition. He didn't ask us for permission to be made. But then we all know where the story goes from there. Sin happens and we wreck God's creation. His perfection is broken. And thus, death enters the world and all of its sundry consequences. But now we hop to the gospel reading. The gospel reading is really the heralding of creation again. A new creation. A creation established once again by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, our gospel reading are the final words of Jesus in the last chapter of Matthew to his disciples right before he ascends to heaven. And these words bring about the spreading of the new creation in Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, a mission which continues to this very day, a mission which each of you are a part of, the going and making of disciples through teaching and baptizing. And here again, the Trinity's presence reigns supreme. God the Father is again the instigator of the whole mission that this is the culmination of, the salvation and redemption of God's people. And the Son is the accomplisher again and doer of all that the Father has given. He obeys His will perfectly. He is the Word made flesh, revealing again from God His Word of life and salvation in the good news of the gospel. Paying the price in our stead that was required in order to restore us to perfect righteousness. And then God the Holy Spirit, as we celebrated last week on Pentecost, sent as the helper from God at the request of the Son. So that we can believe the things that He has told us. It animates our new life in Jesus, without which we would still be, as the Scriptures describe, dead in our trespasses and sins. You see, even in this new creation, we are just as inactive as in the original. Because of sin, we were spiritually dead. And God, in His own grace and mercy, uses His power, even the life of God the Son, in order to bring about new life in you. He didn't ask your permission to save you. He didn't see if you were okay with the sacrifice that he was going to make. He did it for you out of his great love. He promises Jesus. He sends Jesus. Jesus obeys the Father's will. He preaches the good news of God's merciful salvation. And he pays the price 
for sin in our place, rises victorious over the dead, and today sends out his church with his gifts. And the Holy Spirit is given by the Father at the request of the Son to animate this new life in Christ, this new church of his in the world, so that we can bring about the same joy that we receive from God by bringing his very gifts to the ends of the earth. What an incredible power, love, and action that the triune God has made on your behalf. Think about what was given up. Think about what was expended in service to your new life in Jesus. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has done all that for you. But then comes the question, how can we prove it's true? Were you there when Jesus died on the cross? Can you explain how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit even works and yet still one God? Questions that we're afraid that somebody's going to ask us because we don't really know what to say. Questions that parents are afraid their kids are going to ask them because pretty soon it will become apparent that something doesn't quite make sense to them here. And we know that's true. It doesn't make sense to us either, at least not in the worldly intellectual sense that we like. But what does the Bible say about instances like this? Well, Paul, if anybody's a good example of somebody who's fulfilled this mission, it would be Paul, the apostle called to the Gentiles. And what does Paul have to say in 1 Corinthians about fancy words of wisdom? They're not much. Paul's known as a good writer, but in person he wasn't seen to be all that impressive. Apollos was better at that gig than he was. And so he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I didn't come to you with fancy words of wisdom. And he also mentions that the foolishness of God shames the wisdom of the world. But what about reasoned arguments and rationalities? We can look to Proverbs for that one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Well, who God is and how he works and the way he relates to us at root are beyond our understanding. We can't comprehend it. How God works, why he does the things he does for us, yet we still believe. We still confess this creed, the truth of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How? Because of the gift of faith that we have been given through the giving of the word and the Holy Spirit through that word and sacrament. The very mission of God given to the apostles carried down to this day is responsible for your faith. Now, this isn't a cop-out. This isn't an excuse not to think or do the work of research, as Elijah pointed out. When there are things to be learned, God has given us the ability to do so. But in our humility, we must recognize that there will be things we don't understand. That God hasn't revealed to us that we can't figure out on our own. That's why he's given us faith. Faith to believe the things that we can't know. Maybe he hasn't told us because even if he did, we wouldn't understand. Or maybe if he told us it would affect our ability to believe in him. Who knows? But what we do know is that we can trust in God. After we come to faith, a gift from God through the Holy Spirit... God gives us plenty of reasons to believe what he has revealed to us in his word. And Peter calls us to know those, to be ready to give a defense for the things that we believe. But there are things that we believe just because God has said them. And today we're talking about one of those. So as we read today the Athanasian Creed together, and you listen to the words and the truth that they express. Know that you are expressing a true belief in something about God, even if you can't comprehend it. And the purpose of those big words isn't to explain away the problem of the mystery of God, but rather to confess its very truth. And to acknowledge that part of his godliness 
is the fact that as creatures that he has made, we can't understand everything about him. Our triumph God in his great mercy has created us, he has redeemed us and loves us. And even when we disobeyed and sin destroyed the perfection of his creation and damaged our relationship with him seemingly beyond repair, he still took the initiative, expended great effort, energy, and even life in order to give us a new life, in order to bring us into a new creation. He sent Jesus for you. Jesus preached the good news of the gospel for you. And he continues to do so today. He sent you the helper, God the Holy Spirit, to help you believe in things that are beyond your ability to understand. And all this he does in order to save you and spend eternity in heaven with you and the whole church on earth. This is most certainly true. So dear friends in Christ, when God's person and actions are beyond your ability to understand, such as the Trinity today, believe in his word to you. Believe in his name placed on you in your baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we can understand and believe what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, the power of God given for you. You are a new creation. And in our gospel reading as new creatures, as children of God bought with the precious blood of Jesus, he's given us a mission. See, here at Ascension we have a vision statement, but we didn't write a mission statement on purpose because the church throughout the world has the same mission, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that he has commanded. And he has promised to be with us. So dear friends in Christ, baptized in the triune name of God, teach his words. Worship him Bring the gifts of God, those very same gifts which has made you into a new creation to the ends of the earth. For he is one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.